Hello from Oslo and welcome to today's afternoon tea conversation. Uh, I'm Ingeborg and I'm the leader of Women in Global Health Norway. With this series, we're highlighting some of our members and today I'm having a chat with Anna, Anna Stavdal. Uh, she's a GP, the president of Bonka, an international association for family doctors and general practitioners. And uh, she's a long-term outspoken advocate for family doctors in Norway. Welcome, Anna. Thank you very much. What are you currently involved with? As you said, most of my time now is absorbed by the work I'm doing for Wonka World, the World Organization of Family Doctors. This is a global network working in education, research, and professional development, and not least advocacy for family medicine and primary care. So we have member organizations in 111 countries, uh, and we are more or less yeah, half a million members around the world. Amazing, amazing. And I would really like us to come back to some of that because mm -hmm. uh, that opens up a lot of uh, different questions, of course. But uh, just to let uh, the viewers and myself in uh, some insight into what uh, led you to, uh, to where you are today and the roads you've traveled, can you also then just tell us a little bit about the personal history that led you to where you are today? Sure. Um, I think it started when I was, I was a junior doctor. It was my second job after authorization. And I worked in the clinic in, in the center of Oslo where I'm still working actually at the same uh, at least that was the offspring of where I'm now working in my own practice. Because I didn't mention that, that I'm half time Wonka president or 100% Wonka president and half time practitioner also when I'm doing the, the, the Wonka work. Anyway, my boss, um, 10 years my senior, we discussed a lot. Um, I am sort of the second generation after the Second World War, I came after this huge generation of post-war people who were uh, self-confident. They took definition of power in politics and also in medicine, also in family medicine. And I found it very hard to access this, um, I called it a masonry to my boss, Svede. You're a masonry. You're, um, and then one day he said, okay, Anna, now you can beat them from the inside. I'm nominating you for the executive board of the Norwegian College, College of General Practice. And I thought, wow, what have I done? But of course I couldn't say no. That was the start. And six years later, I was the chair of that college for two, uh, two terms in a time where, as we are in now, actually, a primary care and family medicine um, was struggling, recruiting uh, doctors, sustaining services, not least in, in uh, rural and remote areas. And we introduced or the list system, Postlegordningen, was introduced. Um, I was a chair at the college at that time, and we, we did a lot of development work, also stating the values on which our discipline is based. Um, so we did some basic work with which still um, has an influence on the discourse now. Um, and one part of the work in the national college was the Nordic collaboration. Yeah. Um, we run a journal together, the five Nordic countries, the colleges, um, and also a biannual Congress in family medicine. 
you were instrumental in creating this as I yes understand. I was instrumental in in um, in um, establishing a foundation to make sure that we kept the ownership of these arenas in a time where commercialism in medicine and healthcare was really on its way in. Um, it was very important to protect these activities. So I was the first president of the Nordic Federation of General Practice. And that again led me to the European arena. Um, and I was, was nominated and elected vice president for Wonka Europe, which is the European region. By the way, the biggest region in, in Wonka. Uh, we have member organizations in almost every European country, uh, the 53 countries. For 10 years, I was in Wonka Europe as vice president and then president. Well, my, my predecessor, Job, asked me, why don't you stand? And I said, now you have to give me all the reasons why I should not stand, I said to him. And he said, I can't think of one single reason why you shouldn't. And he knew me well. And, and uh, we had been working and also fought some battles together. I mean, that comes with all international work. Um, and he's also a um, critical person. So when he said that, I trusted him <laughs> and thought, okay, uh, let's go for it. So I stood for election and, and was elected president-elect in 2000. 18 and uh and took office as president last november and then for a term of two years oh, that's, so that's a story actually and yeah. how has it been to kind of maneuver because i mean you were young and you i don't know did you have a family at the time uh and maneuvering both the private practice and your private life and and this uh, increasingly activity uh, of high activity level in in uh, in organizational work. How, how how did you experience that? I when I got the first challenge when Sverre nominated me uh, for the executive board at the National College. I was pregnant with my second child. Um, I had already already realized that I needed to do something in addition to uh, to the clinical work I was doing. Also, because in family medicine and in I mean in in, in practices, the way we are organized in Norway and in many many other countries as well, you work in small entity so to say but you represent a very important part of healthcare we used to say this is the this is this is the, the cornerstone of the, the fundament of of healthcare this means that that you also have a, a huge societal role and in order to to um, carry that role out you have to understand the society you're working in and to me, it comes natural that you also want to influence the conditions. And I'm not now speaking about working conditions for the doctor, but the way the system is set up and influence um, uh, how roles and mandates are defined. And that was the way I saw I could do that through uh, organizational work. Um, um, also from that time, actually, and it, it sounds a bit too much, and I guess it was a bit too much, but it was fun and it was doable. So I also had um, and still have a um, um, small post teaching post at the University of Oslo, teaching medical students in 
family medicine and in particular communication skills in my practice. So it came natural. Um, and I think the variety, uh, going back and forth from clinical practice to political development work, teaching, kept me going. Mm -hmm. uh, That's a very unique perspective for you yeah. in both those, or yeah. in all three yeah. worlds in a way. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, so I see now that you're, you stepping into the global stage, so to say, has been a gradual developer, development from the national. Um, have you had any good mentors? You mentioned your colleague mm -hmm. from the start. Uh, have you had any good mentors that have helped you throughout this journey? I think maybe I already mentioned two of them, even if I didn't think about them as mentors. I think actually it's maybe not, it's unmodest to say so, but I think the, the mentorship went both ways. Uh, and um, because I've been thinking about that, in many ways, I was, I was, uh, I was an uh, an island, uh, my own island, uh, and um, I haven't been afraid to raise controversial questions, and that makes it difficult. I mean, if you if you're not willing to make compromises in order to get friends <laughs> you get lonely at times and uh, I can give a couple of examples one is understandable for the big audience I think that was I was one of the leaders of the campaign against the golden bonds between pharmaceutical industry and the medical profession in Norway uh, I led a campaign uh, before uh, the Medical Association approved of a new set of rules, the strictest rules in the world, actually. Uh, at the start of, of this uh, millennium. Um, now, this is, and of course, almost for everyone, that it needs to be strict rules. Um, but that was not the case at that time. So when I started that work, uh, um, I knew I was representing views of many colleagues, but not that many colleagues were willing to or able to, to speak up. So that was a battle where I was, uh, some of my colleagues wanted to demonize me. Uh, I was uh, moralistic and I was, yeah, you know, all these things. Um, but also through this work, I got some allies, which I knew I could trust and who would tell me uh, also, uh, they knew my weak, weaker sides and could uh, give me uh, corrections and say, oh, beware. Um, when I was on the, on the slippery slope, for example. So maybe that is the best mentorship I have had um, uh, from, from friends and professional friends who knew me, who knew me well. Yeah. Uh, but I must confess, I mean, and, and I should be honest uh, when answering that, that those who have been a few steps ahead of me in my development, at least the first part of my career, um, have been very ambivalent to let me grow. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and a lot of envy and uh, because I... Of course, I was inside soft and sometimes desperate and sad, but I was not willing to negotiate on, on the basic values uh, so that I maybe gave an impression that I was 
I was made of concrete. So did you feel that you were supported by your female colleagues? That's a challenging question because my, my first immediate reaction would be no, not specifically. Uh, of course, I have female friends who have supported me, but on the professional arena, uh, they were more uh, ambivalent to support me when I uh, when I picked up fights uh, with the establishment, so to say, uh, because and, and the establishment was led now speaking the Norwegian Medical Association or related bodies, um, the establishment was led by men, not by women. Uh, so, and I, I'm now in, in hindsight, I can, I can um, say it clearer that what I experienced, I was, I didn't, I was not sure I would get the support from female colleagues because I saw on their, um, in their trajectories, they often chose to uh, rely on the support of those in the leadership who were men. So they made compromises, which I was not that willing to, to make. Uh, this is, of course, um, a subjective uh, description, um, but as such, uh, true. Uh, and uh, I cannot speak for, for all my female colleagues, of course, what considerations they made. But this was my, my experience and my observations back then. Do you think that would be different today? I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I know it's uh, different for me today, but that is because of age. Because now I'm not a threat as a younger woman is. Uh, and also I have, I have, I mean, paid my dues and, and showed that, okay, I could stand uh, against or through the battles and I, I stood on my feet. Uh, so, but it's unfair when I look, when I look at younger, younger uh, female colleagues, I think sometimes it's, they are treated unfair, and uh, but also it takes courage. You, you need to take the risk as well, and and risk to risk. To risk. stand alone, perhaps. Or Again. To stand alone, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, uh, say so, okay. If you believe in this, stand your ground. Uh, and of course, in the longer run. Uh, you will be respected for that, and that is where the where friends, I mean, uh, friends, uh, come into the picture. They who can't, they also who have no role in the actual battle, but can say, "You're right, and you're not playing tricks here. You're following what you say you wanted to follow. You are transparent. Uh, things like that support you in that way." Um, mm. but the higher up the ladder you come the the colder it gets I think that is a mutual experience for both men and women so so this is also a challenge when to call it a gendered uh, thing and when it's uh, when it's a general it's a general thing and that is where also we need men to to discuss with, I mean, uh, so the, the reality and the narrative is more valid if you got, get more voices into it. Absolutely, yes, indeed, we need both. 
perspectives. That's for sure. Mm. Mm. Uh, that's uh, that's an interesting observation, and that can kind of bring me back to women in global health, because we are a fairly new network here in Norway, established in 2018, but already we have, as you know, almost 400 members uh, nationally, and we're part of this huge, enormous net global network uh, with the 41 country chapters like ours and uh, thousands of thousands of members. So uh, how, how do you see a place for a network like this in, in, in Norway? Mm. And what attracts you to, to the, to the uh, women in global health? I think there are two reasons um, for my engagement, two main reasons. One is uh, that I'm, <laughs> I'm curious and I also want to, to build networks, networks that men do. It, it just seems to come natural for them. I mean, the professional networks. And so you can go and say, how oh, mm, I'm looking for something else to do, or uh, who knows anything about this? And yes, I have context. We, on the professional arena, women don't seem to, to have that tradition. And I, I think the reasons are obvious because uh, we haven't, taken part in in in, um, in that part of our life for that long uh, even if if uh, there are some decades now uh, so that is one uh, the other is also I think I I want to contribute uh, not least to to younger women uh, younger women um, making their careers and stepping up, taking on leadership roles um, and to share experience and, and support them. Because there are some things you can learn from books and seminars and some things you have to experience in life itself. And I do believe that other experiences of other people can be helpful for me and the other way around. I don't think you have to make the all the experiences yourself from the bottom, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and I also think it's, Norway should be playing a role on the international arena. We're a very privileged country where also women have a lot of opportunities compared to, to other countries. So we should reach out and support sisters uh, all over the world. So maybe that, that were three reasons. But yes. I don't have Very to. Good. I don't. I, I don't have to count them. No. But but, but um, yeah. Mm. Very very good re reasons indeed. And uh, finally, to our viewers out there, what would you like to say to your younger you? What advice would you have uh, wanted um, yourself when you started your career? Mm. Make sure you have allies people who you can trust and they don't need to be in the same field as you because the dynamics in organizational work and in, in power games, let's call it that, are the same, I mean, in, in different fields. So make sure you have allies and people you can trust who can give you the truth <laughs> when, when you least want it. <laughs> uh but also who can who can support you um and know you know your stronger sides uh i think um i think maybe that's the most important uh advice i can give besides believe in believe in yourself i mean if you if you look around corners and you learn that you can look around corners 
that you can read power games and dynamics in groups. Believe in it. Uh, believe in it. Yes, and on that note, Emma, I uh, will have to close our little talk. It's truly been a pleasure to hear your reflections and uh, chat with you. I'm really glad you're part of our network. And I look forward to uh, good meetings uh, in the years to come. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. We look forward to welcoming you back to the next Afternoon Tea Conversation with Women in Global Health Norway. Bye.